disabling story that it quotes a Labour source accusing the former Chancellor Jeremy Hunt of presiding over a black hole and still campaigning for tax cuts. The Financial Times says the wealthy are likely to be in the line of fire. It says higher levies on capital gains and inheritance are not uh, among the options of the country's leaders. The Army says the Chancellor has been urged not to target tax relief on pensions to help address the shortfall. It says some Treasury officials want to lower the amount of relief that higher rate taxpayers would be eligible for. The paper points to projections that show the change would affect 7 million savings by the end of Parliament. The Treasury spokesperson is probably the same they've begun fixing the foundations to grow the economy and keep taxes as low as possible. The Daily Mail says that Labour has been accused of lying about the pledge to cut annual energy bills by up to £300 by the next election. The says the energy secretary, Ed Miliband, refused to make the guarantee when pushed by reporters. It puts the shadow energy secretary, Claire Patino, as uh, saying the government's plans for renewable power got to huge costs to struggling families. The Daily Mirror says Sophia Starmer has renewed his plan to cut energy bills within five years. Secretary James Turner has given his first interview since launching his Tory leadership bid. He tells the Times he's looking to make sure the Conservatives once again are a massive new party. The paper says he's positioned himself in the centre ground. It's quoted as saying that being small and ideologically pure is not what Tories exist to do. Zara danced with a fractured leg, is the headline in the sun. Since the strictly come dancing contestant Sarah McDermott was unaware that she broke a leg while training and danced on in pain. The paper says the BBC has endured a deeply uncomfortable two months over the show. Corporations Director General Tim Davey has apologised for any duty of air breaches and says new protocols are in place to protect contestants. The Express leads on the reaction of the assisted dying campaign of Dave Esther Ransom to the formal introduction in the House of Lords of a bill to legalise the practice in England and Wales. Dame Esther, who has stage 4 cancer, says there are many in Parliament who oppose the change for reasons including religious belief or due to concerns about disabled people. She says the vote brings her hope of an implied hope on her own terms. And that's the papers. This is News Briefing on BBC Radio 4. Now, business and CrowdStrike says that more than 97% of Windows sensors are back online. Only a week after a software update by the cybersecurity firm triggered a global outage. With more details and the rest of the business news is in English. CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz said that his firm had managed to use automatic recovery techniques rather than manual reboots to speed up the process of bringing about eight and a half million devices back online. A week ago, the company's Falcon platform sensor contained a fault that forced computers running Microsoft's Windows operating system to crash and show the so-called blue screen of death. The software was supposed to protect devices from cyber threats that ended up causing havoc globally. OpenAI is working on adding new powers to its artificial intelligence bot, ChatGPT. The company said it was trialing a search feature that incorporates real-time information into ChatGPT, allowing the bot to respond to user questions with up-to-date information and links. OpenAI is aiming to become the internet's go-to search engine. Currently, Google remains by far the dominant player, claiming more than 90% of the market globally. And there are reports that Cineworld is expected to announce today the closure of about 25 sites across the UK as part of a major restructuring plan. According to Sky News, the cinema operator will cut hundreds of jobs and reduce its UK footprint by at least a quarter. Cineworld, which is a British company operating in 10 countries, has not yet publicly commented. Time for the markets now, and in the city, the 100 index finished up by 32 points. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones ended also up by 81 points, which is 0.2%. On the currency markets, the pound's trading at $1.29 against the euro, sterling's at one eighteen. That makes one euro worth 84 pence. Now, sports there have been some early results in football and rugby sevens at the Paris Olympics, which began ahead of the season's open ceremony. Here's Shepard News a winning start to the Olympic women's football tournament. And led by former champion boss and Hayes, they beat Zambia 3-0 and world champion Spain beat Japan 2-1. Meanwhile, Ireland are out of the men's rugby sevens.
happens in Paris, beaten by defending champions Fiji, play Australia in South Bay semi-finals, Carlos France will play South Africa. In the Europa Conference League, qualifying second round, the Monarch will run over the Federation of the Tiger of their time. The Monarch will score the last game in the world. In cricket, the number of days will have to play the Welsh Fire, but will make it down to the Welsh Fire, but will make it down to the Welsh Fire, but will make it down to the Welsh Fire, but will make it down to the Welsh Fire. Hay meadow owned by farmers Tony Harding and Jane Woods 
where Johnny Rook from Cumbria Wildflowers is supervising a rather unusual harvesting operation. This is harvesting, yes. but not with the scale of machinery no. that you might imagine. This has been done on a quad bike with a contraption behind it. We've put it to several things. This is our preferred technique, the push harvesting. We've got the quad bike and it's pulling a big brush sweeper brush type thing. It's got a little hopper on, it's on a little engine. And it collects the seed that's been sworn and then we can bring it back to the sheets, spread it out to allow it to dry a little bit. But it also allows any insects that we might have collected to jump off and escape. We only take the percentage of the seeds. Now the farmer can always come in afterwards and still put the hair. Our target species that one is like a fried egg. That's the most Terry and Jane, this is the fourth year that you have embarked on this process. How does it work? Do you give Johnny a ring when you think, ah, yeah. it's That's looking good. right? That's push the yellow apple ripen within the last 48 hours. It's ready to harvest. And we brought Johnny around yesterday before last night and he's been we kicked to harvest it today. He looks after it all himself. He has a cost to us a big bonus for us. The money that we get from this, it's like the equivalent of selling hate cap. The great thing for us is that we can take the seed and dry it and process it and this seed can then go on to the restoration schemes or the meat and time itself to the or quite often we use that seed to cook plants And quite often people like Tom and Jamie are some kind of fancy cook plants that use seed in their fields. 40 miles away from the Salt Lake Bay, this is where chapter two begins to unfold. The base sticks to that site, a little bit called Great Orton, we power up. We've got poly tunnels, we've got sitting out areas we grow the plants in. This is where we bring the seed back. We have to dry the seed from the storage because it's got moisture in the Sophie Smith, they're a brother and sister from our local village at Bonchester. James is on his sixth season with us and Sophie's on her third season soon with us. And the other girl's Kersher, whose mum I worked with many years ago in New Zealand. She's from the Falkland Islands and she's here to do the boat for us this season. Oh, so she's come over from the Falklands? Yes. It's a real international business she too, isn't it? Yes, we all know each other, we all travel around the world. And when you get older, you also get to meet all your friends' children. <laughs> Hopefully they'll carry on in the industry to keep it going strong. So what's on the cards today? As many as we can possibly get through here. A bit late to start with the rain, but it's backing up the weather. So hopefully we'll shear at least 400 to 500. But well, at the minute the sheep are really sticky because of the cold late spring. When you say sticky, what do you mean by sticky? The lather that sits in the wool, it sets into a hard grease when they're not warm. You can't push through it and if you push too hard then you end up making cuts on the skin. Which we don't want, obviously, not to harm sheep. So you just have to slow your hand down 
Regina Cameron in this week's Oil Club at 6.30 this Sunday morning or on BBC Sounds. Now, agricultural robotics is a real growth area, but most robots have wheels. Researchers at Aberystwyth University are developing software so that commercially available robot dog can be converted into an agricultural sprayer. And yes, you did hear that correctly. And assignments saw their prototype in action at the global show. That is the sound of a four-legged silver robot stomping around in front of me. It comes up to about my knee, and it's been described as a robot dog. Sit. Oh, nice. Well, hold on a little crouch for me. My name is Stephen Thomasville. I'm a computer science lecturer for Ivers Distance Learning at Bristol University. This is a very early prototype uh, research platform that we're using as a precision spray. So, using it for small holdings and places where it's quite difficult to get to for regular farm machinery. We've got a reservoir on the back that controls various types of herbicides that you need to precisely spot the weeds. I'm Dr. David Petlis and I am a distance learning lecturer with Agus Distance Learning as well. We've been approached for poultry houses. They already have robots that go through poultry houses that will help to spray the litter so that you can reduce the amount of disease and the ammonia emissions that are involved. But they're actually finding that sometimes there are issues with these machines because they are on tracks and they're on wheels of getting stuck and also of even actually injuring the poultry themselves. So they are approaching us about this as it can step over, it could be trained to go around. Oh, that's really interesting because I was going to ask about the legs. You see quite a lot of robots on wheels, but I mean, this is more like a dog. It's got four legs. Can you get him to come towards us a minute so we can just take a look at him walking? Here he comes. So it is very novel. You don't see many sort of quadruped robots, four legged robots around. You can get into really difficult areas. So if I move the robot down, you can really get it right down to the roots. Um, oh, right, so it's kind of bending down on its front legs and getting the, the spray nozzle right down close to the ground. But at a feet scale, yeah, that's going to take a long time, bending down to spray each individual weed, isn't it? This is quite a small robot, about the size of a terrier. and how potentially three to be. And it's interesting, David, you mentioned going into poultry sheds. How do they respond to a robot dog? Well, you find with a lot of these things with we've had robot uh, milking with cattle now that a lot of it, it takes an adjustable period. You will find that you need a couple of weeks for animals to get used to the robot. But also with poultry, you generally don't want them to get too used to it because it's actually beneficial for them to be made to get up and actually get off the bedding so they're not getting lesions on their legs and they're actually moving around more, which is much healthier for them. And I know that there has been some look at some of the bigger dogs for actually using them with bins on the back for orchards for as you're picking apples and things like that that you put it on and it would just walk alongside you automatically. That has been done with wheeled automated vehicles as well, but not all of your orchards will necessarily, especially your traditional heritage orchards, aren't on the best ground and you might not find that that works well. So something like this could be an alternative for some of those. One final thing is just on the back of the dog, there's a little label that says, do not pick. You have to be concerned for the dog's welfare. Who's picking? Absolutely. It very much is a marketing tactic with companies which make these quadruped robots and show how rugged and industrial they are. So we prefer to put a little message both English and Welsh just to make sure that no one comes up with those ideas and tries to text. Of course. Not. That report from Heather Simons. Angling groups have warned that illegal fishing is an out of control problem on rivers in Wales with serious impacts for endangered species like salmon. One group said poachers have become brazen due to a lack of enforcement. BBC Wales Environment correspondent Stefan Messenger sent us this report. That's a beautiful fish. Yeah, yeah. An exciting and rare moment for angler Robin Parry as he catches a salmon in the river Ceylon to Gwynedd. But within seconds, he's returned it safely back to the water. This is really good. It's what anyone out fishing is meant to do by law. Number of salmon in Welsh rivers, as well as other endangered fish too, have collapsed in recent decades. Climate change, overfishing at sea, and pollution all thought to be to blame. Now Robin, who's chair of the Ceylon to Gwerevine Friendly Fishing Society, is worried another threat could lead to them disappearing completely from Wales. We're concerned that there's more protection for those sort of small number of apple salmon in the country. In some of the in Wales, we've got such small rivers, and we want to go down the fish can be trapped in the pools. Of course, now is more commercial. Obviously, 
Kim Hayes, a retired police detective, has been the Fishing Society's secretary for almost half a century. The close poaching has become more of a problem for the recent year. Robin and Hugh show me the evidence they gathered of poaching among the corridors. So you've got some photos to show. Yeah, these are some of the nets and things that we've had from the river. This is a net down from Drangunga. There's another net, and this net is anchored here. Here on the floor, it's going across the lake. That looks quite sort of professional, that you, you know, you're pulling out thousands of nets yeah. and all sorts. Yeah. And the other thing we see is these you know, pictures. Yeah, yeah, we know where that is. We can see where it is on the river, and there's a chap holding a bit of sand. There's a big seat out with snare max around the middle. And there's no legal way of having the dead seat you can do it. A call for more enforcement is echoed too at the other end of the country, on the river of Moor near Bridgend. We're told anglers are increasingly getting into confrontations with poaching banks. You need to tell your friends not to come, they cannot net and they cannot fish here. Brian is chair of the Ogmore Angling Association. What poaching is a massive issue, especially at the moment. The last about five or ten years we've just seen a, a real deterioration and an influx of people who are just fishing illegally on the river. Last week, one of our members was threatened by a gang of individuals and he was chased off. So it's having quite an impact on some of our members, you know, they've been traumatised by the violence. We asked the Environment Watchdog Natural Resources Wales for figures on legal fishing and were provided with data for the last four years. Since 2021, there have been more than 200 reports a year of illegal fishing, with an increase over that time in the number classed as high level, requiring an immediate response. There were 165 prosecutions in total for fisheries offences, most of which were for fishing without a licence. NRW say it shows they're taking action. So I'm Ben Wilson, the Principal Fisheries Advisor of Natural Resources And if you see some of the cases that we have been able to take to court recently, some fairly hefty fines levied against people, so there's a real deterrent there. Fishing groups say the future of angling in Wales is at stake if more isn't done to tackle those not following the rules. NRW is urging anyone who witnesses what looks to be illegal fishing to contact them. And that was Stefan Messenger reporting, and that is it from us for this morning. I'm Kaz Graham, producer is Alan Beach, and I'll be today to the BBC Audio Crystal Collection. This is a day program news next here on Radio 4, but first a word from Peter White. Hello, good evening, good evening. For half a century, I presented In Touch, the program about the lives and experiences of blind and partially sighted people. So, sit back and enjoy the flight. Over that time, a great deal has changed for us, some good, some not so good. So what can we learn from the last 50 years, and how might technology shape our next 50? The emphasis hasn't been on keeping things accessible. That's been forgotten about. 50-50 Vision, with me, Peter White, this Sunday night at 7.15 on Radio 4 and BBC Sounds. On FM, on BBC Sounds and on your smart speaker, this is BBC Radio 4. It's 6 o'clock on Friday, the 26th of July. Good morning, this is today with a mock version of the story. The headlines this morning. An independent report has identified a catalogue of failures at the Care Quality Commission. The health sector consists of regulators that are not fit for purpose, the street named John yesterday. The Chancellor is expected to reveal there was a black hole in the public finances totaling tens of billions of pounds. She sets out the findings of the Treasury audit. Also in today's programme, a bill to legalise assisted dying is being introduced into the House of Lords today. We'll hear from the man behind it and assess its chances of becoming law. More dolphins and whales are being spotted in UK waters. There's a mother and calf quite close to the pier and some boats that have stopped to look at it too. They're swimming around and the mother's probably teaching her calf how to feed. Researchers are trying to work out why and they need your help to do it. And... It's Olympic opening ceremony day. We'll look ahead to the Paris Olympics with Lord Sebastian Coe, Rebecca Addington, Sir Steve Redgrave, and the music director behind tonight's opening ceremony. BBC News is read by Alan Smith. 
The health secretary, Wes Streeting, has said the body responsible for regulating health and social care services in England is not fit for purpose. He's reacting to an independent review of the Care Quality Commission, which identified significant failings at the watchdog. The CQC said it accepted the findings in full. Here's our health correspondent, Nick Tribble. The government has said the review ordered in May under the Tories had found a catalogue of failings at a regulator. These include inspectors lacking the necessary experience, including some sent into hospitals despite never having visited one. There is also a backlog in inspections, with one in five services yet to even receive a rating. Where Streeting said he was stunned by the failings and measures were now being put in place. These include the appointment of former Chief Inspector of Hospitals, Sir Mike Richards, to work with the CQC's leaders. The Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, has confirmed that she'll set out the results of a spending audit, which are expected to say there is a multi-billion pound black hole in the public finances. Speaking at a meeting of the G20 finance ministers in Brazil, Ms Reeves said her statement to Parliament on Monday would be honest about the scale of the financial challenge faced by the new government. But experts believe the announcement could pave the way for tax rises later this year. Our economic editor Faisal Islam reports. Treasury officials have been collating a long list of decisions on public services that require urgent attention. Rachel Reeves will suggest her predecessor left various crucial public services unfunded and underfunded in areas from public pay to prisons. She did not confirm or deny speculation that all of this could add up to a shortfall of more than £20 billion. Labour sources said on Monday the British public are finally going to see the true scale of the damage the Conservatives have done to the public finances. The opposition say that this is an elaborate effort to butter up the public with some tax rises at the budget in the autumn. The MP for Rochdale, Paul War, says the family of a man who was kicked to the stamp on by a police officer at Manchester Airport was justice. But he added that they were appealing for calm and did not want to take part in any protests. The Independent Office for Police Conduct has begun an investigation. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu will hold talks with Donald Trump at the former president's resort in Florida later today. Yesterday, Mr Netanyahu met President Biden and Vice President. David Willis. Benjamin Netanyahu paid tribute to Joe Biden's many decades of support as the two leaders met for the first time since Hamas attacked Israel last October. Officials have insisted for months that agreement on a ceasefire deal that would pave the way to the release of the hostages is imminent. Such a deal is now seen by Mr. Biden as the potential cornerstone of his political legacy. An urgency underscored by Mr. Biden's deputy, Kamala Harris, who, following her own meeting with the Israeli leader, expressed concerns about the extent of human suffering in Gaza, calling the situation there catastrophic. The latest in a long line of attempts to give terminally ill people in England and Wales the legal right to end their own lives will begin today, with campaigners now optimistic that the law could soon change. A private member's bill will be introduced in the House of Lords before a debate in the autumn. But critics say it would send a message to the vulnerable and disabled that their lives are worth less than others. A disabled man has spent nearly 10 months in a hospital in Surrey because no suitable home has been found for him in the community. Matthew Sharp, who's 36, has a range of complex conditions. He says he's been left in limbo while the NHS and local councils try to agree who is responsible for his care. NHS Surrey Heartland said it was no longer responsible for his care, so referred him to Surrey County Council. The council says it's looking for a permanent home for him. Mr Sharp says being stressed doesn't help his situation. Life is very difficult at the moment. Life is sad and I've got a lot of anger. I couldn't get work at the top of Mr Circle. And then I'm my, you know, my back things get worse when I'm patient when I'm stressed and when I'm upset. And final preparations are underway for the opening ceremony of the Paris Olympics. The event will see boats carry athletes and dignitaries down the River Seine later today. Tens of thousands of police and soldiers will be on duty to secure the route.
Thank you, 6 minutes past 6, to the weather, Darren Beck has it for us uh, today, my Darren. Morning Justin, it's a very interesting weather on the way, to say the least, uh, for the uh, opening of the Olympic Games in Paris this evening. It could be very wet and there could be some thunderstorms as well. Nothing quite so bad as that here in the UK, for many parts of the country it will be a pleasant change to see some spells of sunshine today. Already one or two uh, showers around, mind you, and as the cloud builds up a little bit more today, as temperatures rise, we'll see more showers breaking out. And the majority of those are going to be across Scotland, Northern Ireland, perhaps northern parts of England. One or two heavy showers as well, the risk of some thunder this afternoon in the northeast of Scotland. There will be the odd shower perhaps across Wales and the southwest of England and the uh, Midlands, but it should stay dry across East Anglia and the southeast of England. Got a westerly breeze for all of us today. It's bringing a slightly fresher feel, but at least there will be some spells of sunshine. And those temperatures are reaching around 17 or 18 degrees in Scotland and Northern Ireland. For England and Wales, for many places, 19 to 21 Celsius. But it will be warmer in East Anglia and the southeast. Temperatures reaching a reasonable 23 or 24 Celsius. Should be a pleasant day here. The showers that do develop uh, today will fade away very quickly this evening. Most places are ending the day dry and quite sunny. More showers, though, will arrive later in the night and there'll be more showers around for Saturday. The bulk of those will be affecting eastern Scotland, northern England, Wales and the southwest of England, with temperatures similar to today. Darren, thank you very much indeed. It is seven minutes past six. Let's have a look at this morning's papers and what's on the news websites. Uh, the Daily Telegraph says the Chancellor is preparing to reveal a £19 billion shortfall in the public finances. The paper says Rachel Reeves is laying the ground for an autumn tax raid. The Guardian has the same lead story. It quotes a Labour source accusing the former Chancellor Jeremy Hunt of presiding over a black hole and still campaigning for tax cuts. The Financial Times says the wealthy are likely to be in the line of fire. It says higher levies on capital gains and inheritances are among the options open to Miss Reeves. The AI says the Chancellor has been urged not to target tax relief on pensions to help address the shortfall. It says some Treasury officials want to lower the amount of relief that higher rate taxpayers would be eligible for. The paper points to projections that show that change would affect 7 million savers by the end of the Parliament. A Treasury spokesperson is quoted as saying they've begun fixing the foundations to grow the economy and keep taxes as low as possible. The Daily Mail says Labour has been accused of lying about a pledge to cut annual energy bills by up to £300 by the next election. The paper says the Energy Secretary, Ed Miliband, who saw this programme yesterday, refused to make the guarantee when pushed by reporters. It quotes the Shadow Energy Secretary, Claire Coutinho, as saying the government's plans for renewable power will help, sorry, will heap huge costs on struggling families. The Daily Mirror says Sir Keir Starmer has renewed his vow to cut energy bills within five years. The Shadow Home Secretary James Cleverley has told the Times is looking to make sure the Conservatives are once again a mass appeal party. The paper says he's positioning himself in the centre ground. He's quoted as saying that being small and ideologically pure is not what the Tories exist to do. The Daily Express leads on the reaction of the assisted dying campaigner Dave Mester Ransom to the formal introduction in the House of Lords of a bill to legalise the practice in England and Wales. Dave Mester who has stage four cancer, says there are many in Parliament who oppose the change for reasons including religious belief or due to concerns about uh, people with disabilities. But she says the vote brings her hope of a dignified end on her own terms. And I should say we're speaking to Lord Faulkner, I think later on in this hour, aren't we, Justin? Yep, yeah, that's the plan. Uh, and uh, actually we're having several conversations about assisted dying throughout the course of the programme. Uh, and we'll ask uh, Wes Streeting, the Health Secretary, about it perhaps at 10 past eight. Um, to the sun, Zara danced with a fractured leg, is their headline. It says the Strictly Come Dancing contestant, Zara McDermott, was unaware that she had broken a leg bone while training. She danced in pain. The paper says the BBC has endured a deeply uncomfortable two months over the show. And uh, Director General Tim Davis apologised for any duty of care breaches, says new protocols are in place to protect contestants. According to the Times, Formula One team bosses have been told to ensure drivers mind their language during races, the paper says the warning follows an expletive-filled outburst on team radio by the world champion Max Verstappen during the Hungarian Grand Prix. The sports authorities have apparently said drivers are role models and should act accordingly. Don't they know that children across the world will be watching live Formula One? So when you go to that team radio, you know, what if children are hurt, offended by Max Verstappen's use of expletives? Certainly added a lot to the sport. Ten past six. It's the Olympic opening ceremony in Paris tonight and Andrew Harding, our Paris correspondent, can set the scene for us. Andrew, morning from uh, 
from rainy London. Uh, the pictures of Paris this morning, Andrew, uh, suggest a rather ghostly uh, capital city because so much, it, so much of it is cordoned off in preparation for this opening ceremony. Morning, Amal. Yes, grey and ghostly. It's a, a strange scene at the moment because the ceremony is going down the River Seine, four miles worth in the centre of Paris, and most of that has been cordoned off already for several days now by about 44,000 security barriers, and today we're told 45,000 French police and, and soldiers are going to be guarding that area. So already it's a slightly eerie feeling because tourists who would normally be flooding the centre of Paris while Parisians are all vanishing for their summer holidays, they would normally be around Notre Dame, around the Eiffel Tower and so on. But right now it's very quiet. And there is something, I mean, it's, a, it's an unusual opening ceremony. We're speaking to the music uh, director behind um, that opening ceremony a bit later in the programme. But it's unusual in that it's the first time there's ever been an opening ceremony that's not actually in a sports stadium. Yes, President Macron called it audacious and he's very keen for it to showcase the beauty of Paris, the history of Paris. We're expecting, it's still a mystery, but we're expecting some extraordinary uh, scenes along the river with thousands of the athletes, not all the athletes, um, but at least 7,000 going in some 100 barges are being taken to the foot of the Eiffel Tower.